Well, hey guys, today we are talking about time-restricted feeding and how it improves digestion and your microbiome. And so when we think about your gut flora or your microbiome, it's literally a whole ecology of its own. So there are thousands of different strains of bacteria, viruses, uh, fungus, yeast, right? All these different microbes, different amoeba that are in there, um, so different types of parasites as well. And when it's functioning optimally, they all work together and it should be a natural balanced ecosystem and they help work on our immune system. So about 80% of our immune response comes from what's happening in our gut. So extremely critical there. Uh, bacteria in our gut help our body produce B vitamins. We couldn't digest and assimilate nutrients without these microbes. So they actually break down food particles and they produce things like short chain fatty acids, uh, B vitamins, vitamin K, they help us absorb minerals. Very important role as far as that goes. They also play a big role in um, insulin sensitivity. And so our metabolism, our ability to store fat, burn fat, uh, build lean body tissue plays a very important role in that and also plays a very important role in brain function. So we know when there's disruption in the gut, it ends up causing a breach in the blood brain barrier and causes increased amount of inflammation in the brain. There's conditions like autism and ADHD, different neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and there is a big role that the gut plays in these kinds of conditions. And so when we have bad gut microbes, we're going to have more inflammation in our body and a lower quality of life. And so good, healthy bacterial microbial colonies, good, healthy microbiome allows our immune system to have the right amount of regulatory T cells as well as cytotoxic T cells to help kill bacteria, you know, bad bacteria, viruses, different pathogens, but also to protect us. The regulatory T helper cells help to protect us from destroying our own self tissue, creating autoimmune conditions and things like that. We also get a lot a buildup of immune cells in our mucosal membrane called IgA, serum IgA, which protect us against an overgrowth of different microbes, pathogenic microbes, or just the overgrowth, the, the overall amount. So we have a, a certain microbial load that uh, that we need to keep in check. And when that load gets too much, gets to be too much, we need to trim it down. It's kind of like mowing our lawn. When our lawn gets to be um, you know, too long, it creates an environment that's ripe for the growth of lots of different um, you know, bugs and weeds and all kinds of stuff like that, that isn't good for the land. And so we mow our lawn, we trim you know, and we mow, and that helps keep things under control. It's kind of the same thing in our gut. And so we want to make sure we're able to do this on a regular basis. If not, we're going to be set up for different pathologies, different chronic inflammatory conditions. And so time-restricted feeding is another term for intermittent fasting. And we talk about this from the perspective of, you know, like a 24-hour period. So if we were to eat our meals, two to three meals, let's say in an eight-hour eating window, then we would have a 16 hour fasting window. So we've compressed our, our eating window and that's called time restricted feeding. Now what we know is that this process, intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding process takes stress off the gut. So if we're constantly eating, it's a lot of mechanical physical stress that's on the gut. So it's this constant wear and tear. It's kind of like if we have, you know, if we're constantly walking or running, we're constantly putting wear and tear on our knees, our ankles, things like that. And it's very easy to have damage to our intestinal lining. And it would be like a sprained ankle. So let's say we create inflammation, we damage the intestinal lining. Now we've got a sprained ankle. And if we continue to walk on it, we're continuing to provide this sort of structural um, mechanical stress on the gut, which can really wear it down and continue to damage it and inflame that area and open up the, the gap junctions in the intestines and, make, and cause further problems. So that's one big thing that time-restricted feeding does. It allows more time to heal. It also reduces inflammation in the gut. So it reduces inflammatory cytokines and cytokine activity, helps to create more T helper cells in the gut. It improves the micro microbiome diversity. It also activates stem cells in the gut lining. So we get stronger, healthier, more stress-resistant intestinal cells. And it increases certain healthy bacteria that I'm going to go through as we go on. So... 
I always use this term, the more energy the body uses on digestion, the less energy we have on healing and repair. So if we're constantly eating food every few hours, we're putting all of our energy into digestion, we're putting very little energy into healing and repair. And that sort of process creates a high amount of circulating inflammatory proteins that are in our system. And the reason why is that the act of eating itself is inherently inflammatory. When we're eating food, we are bringing in pathogens. We're bringing in bacteria and different microbes that are coming in through our mouth, even if the food is sterilized and cooked. And the body responds to that by increasing inflammatory compounds. In fact, when insulin is released, that elevates the activity of inflammatory gene pathways. So we get an elevation of inflammation whenever that happens. So the less often we eat, it's not necessarily the amount of food we eat, it's really the, um, the um, amount of times we are putting food in our mouth. That is a critical role in the amount of inflammation we're having. So if we're able to reduce from eating, let's say four or five times a day down to eating twice a day, that's gonna be, significant when it comes to reducing the amount of structural mechanical pressure on the gut, as well as um, the amount of times we boost up insulin and trigger inflammatory pathways. Now, when we look at the role of fasting and how this, how this works, when we fast, we increase the amount of T regulatory cells, which again, help protect our immune system from damaging self tissue we downregulate the inflammatory Th17 cells, which is you know, an important inflammatory pathway that triggers autoimmunity. So we downregulate that. We also improve the amount of adiponectin release, which helps our body burn fat. And we reduce the amount of leptin. We improve our leptin sensitivity, which tells us we're satiated. So we have better satiation. And that plays a big role in reducing inflammation in the brain. High leptin is associated with high amounts of inflammation in the brain. And so we get a lower amount of inflammatory cytokine activity throughout the body, including the central nervous system, which reduces inflammation throughout our whole body. So we get better brain function, better central nervous system function, and um, also better gut microbiota function as well. That's an interesting study. This was out of the Journal of Gas, Turkish Journal of Gastroenterology in 2019, the end of the year, December 30th. And they were looking at Ramadan and this sort of time restricted feeding where during Ramadan, uh, the Islamic individuals that are practicing this, they fast from water and food actually during the daylight hours. So they're often eating in like a four to eight hour eating window. A lot of people are um, only eating one meal a day, for example, when they're doing this. And what they tracked and found is that this actually increased in several weeks of doing this, it actually increased the abundance of several different types of bacteria, Ackermansia mucinophilia, Bacterioides fragilis, and also uh, Phacobacterium prusnitsi, if I'm saying it right. Okay, and these bacteria are are actually called the signs of metabolic health in our gut. And what we know is that they reduce inflammation. And when, when we have these, there's a reduction in overall inflammation, there's a reduction in type two di diabetes and overall better metabolic health. And so this right here, this, this image that you guys can see is kind of a showing what's happening. So Ackermansia mucinophilia, if you look at the end of that, this is actually called a keystone bacteria, Ackermansia. And Ackermansia is associated, when you have higher amounts of Ackermansia, reduced risk of inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, heart disease, almost every known chronic degenerative uh, disease, autoimmune diseases, and gut diseases. And what it does, like the, its, its last name, eucinophilia, it loves mucus, right? So it actually can eat the mucosal lining of the, the gut. So it's the protective mucosal lining. And what happens there is the body responds by actually creating more mucus and creating a thicker, more resilient mucus membrane. So it's almost like trimming it will allow it to become stronger and more resilient. So really, really powerful from that perspective. And I was talking to a, an expert and that interview will be coming out uh, in the future, but he was telling me that basically there are three different, it's like, it's like a food chain in a sense. 
there's three different types of species of bacteria. You have your larger bacteria that kind of sit at the top and eat food when it comes in. Then you have your middle ground bacteria, and then you have your bacteria which are deep in the mucosal membrane. And when we intermittent fast, we actually provide fuel for all three of those. When we're consistently eating throughout the day, every few hours, the larger bacteria dominate. They eat most of the food, and the small, the, the ones that are near the bottom, like Acromansia, start to reduce and die off. And we actually get a weaker intestinal mucous membrane. We actually create a lot more endotoxin or toxins that are released by uh, the specific larger bacteria that are in there that end up creating more inflammatory processes. So inflammation has a really, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Um, time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting has a really big role when it comes to reducing metabolic endotoxemia, right? And you guys can see that in that first uh, the, the, the picture on the left here where you have LPS, lipopolysaccharides, um, that are causing, they're seeping in and damaging the intestinal lining. They're damaging the, the tight junctions between the intestinal cells. And so as that mucous membrane thickens, now we get a reduced amount of LPS, lipopolysaccharide, a reduced amount of metabolic endotoxemia, and our body is much safer and healthier, and we've got a reduced amount of inflammation throughout the system. So time-restricted feeding, intermittent fasting, really, really powerful. It also favors the development of certain types of bacteria that are known to produce anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, for example, which reduces inflammation in the gut and reduces inflammation in the endothelial lining of the blood vessels, reducing your risk of heart disease and insulin resistance. So um, really powerful stuff, guys. And the way that you practice intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding is a good, good place to start would be 12 hours between your last meal and your first meal. We call that a simple fast. So if you finish dinner at 7 p.m., you don't eat again until 7 a.m. the next morning. Then you, you, start by, you start your day by drinking a lot of water. And when you do that, drink 16 to 24 ounces of water before you think about food. Now you're able to push that meal out a few more hours. You do what we call a brunch fast, 14 hours. Then you might want to push that fast out to 16 hours. So if you finish your dinner by 6 p.m., you wouldn't eat anything until, until uh, 10 a.m. the next day. And you do that two times a week, non-consecutive days, like a Monday, Thursday, or something like that. And if you feel good with that, then you can do a cycle fast where you're doing it every other day. You're doing a 16-hour fast. The other days, you might do a 12 to 14-hour fast. And then if you're feeling good with that, you can push it out to what we call a strong fast where you're doing 16 to 18 hours every day um, where you're uh, fasting between that range and you're eating your meals in a six to eight-hour eating window. Six-hour eating window would be like eating your meals between 12 p.m. and 6 p.m. as an example. Okay, And so this is something I do on a daily basis, I personally feel really good doing something like an 18 hour fast. Usually I'm eating my meals between one and seven or 12.30 and 6.30, somewhere in that range. And then once or twice a week, I do a full 24 hour fast, usually twice a week, where I only do one meal. It's like a lunch to lunch or a dinner to dinner. And that sort of fasting regimen I have noticed has made a huge improvement on my inflammatory levels, my brain health, my, my central nervous system health, my ability to, to think sharply and quickly to get a lot done, um, and also my physical muscle strength, just my strength and endurance in general. I feel really, really good. And that's because I'm significantly reducing endotoxin. I'm increasing that mucosal membrane, increasing the amount of bacteria that produce short chain fatty acids, and keeping my body in a very strong, healthy, and resilient state. Now, when I do eat, I eat a lot of food. So this isn't about calorie restriction. It's not about eating less. It's about eating less often. So when I eat a meal, I'm usually eating like 1,000 calories in that meal, if not more. So I've got to get my 2,500, 3,000 calories in, in you know, basically two meals uh, most days. And then when I do one meal, I'm usually doing about 1,000 to 1,500 calories. So I'm in a slight calorie restricted mode. And that's good because that challenges my body to break down old damaged cells, this process of autophagy where I self eat and damn it and, and get rid of bad mitochondria and rebuild new healthy mitochondria. Then when I eat again, I'm feasting again. So again, most of my meals are somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 calories. Okay. But I'm only eating once or twice a day. 
And when I do eat, I eat really healthy, good foods that taste amazing. I take um, digestive enzymes before my meal and I take oftentimes stomach acid support, especially if I'm eating uh, like meat or something like that to help my body be able to break that down, metabolize it optimally. And I feel wonderful doing this and it makes a huge difference on our gut. And another strategy that can also be really impactful is a partial fast where we're consuming somewhere around 40% of our normal calorie load, okay? And you can do this for multiple days. You can do a bone broth, three day, three to five day bone broth fast or green juice fast, or there's something called the fasting mimicking diet, which you can actually get um, basically food in a box, right? And it's a low carbohydrate, high fiber, healthy, high fat, low protein sort of diet that helps our body stimulate autophagy, helps reset the microbiome, really good stuff. You can also do things like the Daniel fast out of the Bible or um, a fat or keto fast where you're just really primarily consuming fats and keeping your calorie, your overall calorie load down. And all those things can have a dramatic impact on autophagy, on self-healing and on microbiome health. So these are all helpful strategies. Hopefully this was a good training that you guys got a lot out of this and you can check out the article that goes with this where I've got the research. So you can check that out in the links below and hopefully everybody has a wonderful day. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and you can hit the bell button so you get all the notifications whenever I go live. Be blessed guys and we'll see you on a future online training.